Today's video is about dependent probability, and for the beginning of it, we're going to watch another video by Kolu Math. So I'd like you to uh, listen along with this video. It's got some good examples. And you can see that I'm in the middle of it here. I didn't, uh, we're not seeing the whole thing, but we are going to see the last part of it. So you're listening. Pretend that you and your friend are at the fair and they're having a raffle and, and in fact um, you notice that there's not very many tickets in the drum there and uh, you and your friend both enter. There's eight total tickets, two of which, um, one belongs to your friend and one belongs to you. And they're actually doing two drawings in a row here. And we want to know what is the probability of both you and your friend winning. First question we want to ask is how many times are we repeating this test or how many trials do we have here? In this case, since there's two drawings, we're going to have two trials. Let's take a look. Trial one, we have all eight tickets. Both you and your friends are still there. So that gives us a two, because there's two tickets that'll make us happy, out of an eight total amount of tickets. And once one of those tickets is removed, because we're assuming that the trial was successful, seven total tickets now, and one of those, which is a winner for us. So now we have two fractions, two over eight, one over seven, go ahead and combine them. So 2 over 8 times 1 over 7 gives you 2 over 56, or 1 over 28. Um, still pretty rare odds of both you and your friends winning in a, uh, even such a small raffle. Try the calculation with 800 total tickets, and you'll see what I mean. Okay, let's take a look at this example here. I'm sure you're all familiar with spinners, and uh, the question we're going to ask today is what is the probability of spinning a number greater than 4 twice in a row? Okay. So we actually have two numbers here that are greater than 4. We have 5 and we have 6. And since we're going to be spinning the spinner twice, we have two trials. So on spinner 1, I'm going to spin the spinner and hypothetically land on either 5 or 6. One of those will be removed. And uh, we'll get over to trial 2 and we'll spin. And now since there's only one that will make us happy out of five total edges, we'll take those two numbers and multiply them together. Wait a minute. Does this make sense? Is that the way a spinner works? When you spin a spinner and it lands on a number, do you lose that option for the next round? No. No matter how many times I spin a spinner, I'm always going to have the same number of possible outcomes. And if I'm looking for specific results, I'm always going to have that same amount of specific results. Remember, no matter how many times you spin a spinner, or roll a dice, or flip a coin, it will always have the same number of possible outcomes. So what's the difference here? On the left hand, we've got these spinners so that don't ever change, no matter how many times we repeat the experiment. And then we have something like a bag of jelly beans on the right hand side that does change every time we do an experiment. In fact, might drastically change, depending on how many times we do an experiment. Well, those two things are called events, and we can define them as being either independent or dependent. Independent events are when the outcome of the event does not influence the outcome of a second event. So again, flipping a coin, spinning a spinner, rolling a dice, no matter how many times we repeat those experiments, the situation is always going to be the same. However, with dependent events, the outcome of one event does influence the second event. So for example, drawing cards or picking from a bat, and that only works when drawn items are not returned. So a question you'll want to ask yourself when solving for compound probability is does it depend what happens the first time? If the answer is no, then the events are independent. If the answer is yes, then the events are dependent. It depends what happens. So let's go back to our spinner problem. The spinner used in the second trial is exactly the same as the spinner used in the first trial. No matter how many times you spin it, it will always have the same number of outcomes that two wedges greater than the number four out of six total wedges is the same probability we have for the second trial. So, as you probably expect, we take the two fractions and we multiply them together. This would be true if we did three trials, five trials, or a hundred trials. Two over six times two over six gives us four over 36, which we can reduce to one over nine. Oh, wow. Uh, looks like we've got another one of these stretchy questions. Well, okay, let's take a look at it. That gentleman you're seeing in front of you there, that young man there, is uh, Bobby Fisher. And uh, 
Uh, Bobby Fischer is well known for being one of the finest uh, chess players ever in the history. Some say he's the greatest ever. And when young Bobby Fischer was just 14 years old, he was in the finals of uh, actually eight different U.S. championship chess matches. He got into the final round of eight different ones. And uh, we want to calculate here, what is the probability that Bobby wins all eight of those home matches? So we have a, probably a one-half chance of winning because he's just got to play one round against one guy. So he's either the winner or he's not. And I guess we can take all those numbers and multiply them together, and that gives us one over 256, a very small chance. No, no I, I hope you guys picked up on that there. Uh, actually, we wouldn't do that because, believe it or not, Fisher the guy there on the left there with the big grin was actually a genius and a, uh, an expert in chess. In fact, he, uh, at 14 years old, won all eight of those championships. Because remember, chess is not a game of random chance. It's a game of skill. And probability only works for random games of chance, not for games of skill or ability. Okay? Just remember that. You, you saw some dependent versus independent. When the second event affects what happens the first time, that's called dependent probability. So you can represent dependent events in a tree diagram just like we did before. So it says, suppose there are three yellow cards and two red cards. They are shuffled and placed in a stack. You are asked to draw two cards randomly, one at a time from the stack, without looking at the cards. The probability of drawing a particular color card will change after the first draw because the sample space for the second event changes. It does not say that you're putting the card back. You're not replacing it. So you're going to have one less card. So starting off with five of them, three out of five being yellow and two out of five being red, you're not replacing it. So say you pick a yellow card one of these cards is now gone so now you only have two yellow ones out of the four that are left you still have the two red ones out of the four that are left and you can see here that two fourths and two fourths equals one three fifths and two fifths equals five fifths which equals one even though the denominator is going down when you still have to have 100 percent of your probabilities shown in your tree diagram say you pick a red one first so say this time you pick one of the red cards, you do not replace it. That means there's only one out of red card, red card, four red cards left, and there are three out of the four that are yellow cards that are left, but three-fourths and one-fourth put those together, they do equal a probability of one. So yellow, yellow would be three-fifths times two-fourths, which is six-twentieths, and yellow, red would be three-fifths times two-fourths, which would be six-twentieths. Red-yellow would be two-fifths times three-fourths, which is six-twentieths. And red-red would be two-fifths times one-fourth, which is only two-twentieths. And now when I add these all together, six-six-six is eighteen plus two more gives me twenty-twentieths. That's one hundred percent of my possibilities. So the probability that um, he gets a red after another red was already picked would be, as you saw there, 2 twentieths. And I don't reduce it, so we're not going to pay attention to that. It's still using the multiplication rule, but you have to only do the second event after the first event A happened, and usually the denominator goes down by 1. So picking cards, as you saw in the video, does affect the second event because we're not putting it back. Dependent events, you cannot simply count the outcomes to find all the possibilities of the compound events. So in the next question here, we have the, those cards that said deed on them, D-E-E-D. -E -E -D. A deck of four cards with the letters deed are placed facing down on a table. Two cards are turned at random to show the letter. Draw a tree diagram to represent the possible outcomes in this event. So they're, they're face down. Once you pick one of the cards, you can't pick it again because it says pick two of them at random. So the first D is two fourths. The second D would only be one out of three of them left. If you pick D first, you still have the two E's out of three cards that are left. If you pick an E first, so two out of four of them are an E, going back up to that picture, two out of four of them are an E. So say you pick a E first. 
So now picking a second card, you have two Ds here left, so two out of the three cards are left, this one's gone, and you only have one out of three cards that's an E. So getting a DD is two-fourths times one-third, which is two-twelfths. Getting a DE is two-fourths times two-thirds, and yes, if you want to write in the probabilities here, you can. Two-fourths times two-thirds, which would be four-twelfths. The first one. If you want to write in what you're multiplying, that's great. E and then D would be two fourths times two thirds, which would be four twelfths. And the last one, E and then E, would be two fourths times one third, which would be two twelfths. And checking to make sure I have all of them correct, two plus four plus four plus two does give me twelve twelfths. So I do have all of my possibilities listed there. Solve a probability problem involving dependent events without replacing it. So they're not telling you you're putting it back in. You're not picking a marble, a green marble, and then putting it back in the jar. You're picking a green marble and keeping it out. So if you start with eight green marbles and four red marbles, two marbles are randomly drawn one at a time without replacing it. Find the probability of drawing a green marble followed by a red marble. So, to do that, green is 8 out of 12 and red is 4 out of 12. Once I pick a green one here, I only have 7 out of 11 of them left. But I do have all four of the red ones out of 11 marbles left. If I pick a red one first, 4 twelfths, I have 8 green ones out of 11 left. And if I pick a um, red one and then a red one, I only have three out of 11 red ones left. So green, green would be 8 twelfths times 7 elevenths, which would be 56 out of 132. Green, red would be 8 twelfths times 4 elevenths, which would be 32 out of 132. Red, green would be 4 twelfths times 8 elevenths, which would be 32 out of 132. 12 times 11, 132. And red, red would be 4 twelfths times 3 elevenths, which would be 12 out of 132. And again, I can check myself adding 56 and 32 makes um, 88 plus 32 would give me 120 plus 12 more would give me 132 out of 132. So the probability of green and then red after you picked a green, so green, red would be, as we saw here, green, red, 32 out of 132. Find the probability of randomly drawing a red marble followed by a green. So red and then green would be 4 twelfths times 8 elevenths, Looking back up at my tree diagram is 32 out of 132. Probability of drawing two green marbles. So green, green, looking back up, I have 8 twelfths times 7 elevenths, which is 56 out of 132. And find the probability of randomly drawing two red ones. Well, that's 4 twelfths times 3 elevenths, which is 12 out of 132. So you'll see in class that we're going to be answering some questions and we have to think about, does it say that it's replaced or not replaced? So we're either going to have dependent, not replaced, or independent, putting it back in, or something like flipping a coin, spinning a spinner, like we saw on the video. So that's it for today.